and welcome. Uh, we're excited to bring you our new webinar for the month of September, our Global Currency Outlook. Uh, we were mentioning at the top how we had muted everyone's lines, uh, turn off the cameras, and you'll notice that there's a control panel where I see we already have a number, uh, dozens of questions, and we'll go through those. But uh, I really want to just touch on uh, the speakers. Uh, myself, I'm uh, Joe Menimbo. I'm the currency strategist uh, for the U.S. Uh, for North America. Uh, joining me today is uh, Stephen Dooley. He's my counterpart in APAC. And uh, Rob. Uh, Rob is the director of hedging for APAC. And he's going to be talking, uh, he's going to be providing some key insights and considerations to help companies uh, like yours manage FX risk. So uh, the agenda today, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Steve is going to kick things off for us. Uh, and he's going to be covering the global economic outlook. Uh, from there, uh, Steve will toss it to me and I'll cover uh, the North America perspective. I'll give it back to Steve and he'll cover uh, the APAC outlook. And then uh, Rob, Rob is going to highlight uh, the risk management update. And then from there, uh, we'll go on to the Q&A session. So uh, what we want to do here, uh, I do want to highlight some of the key uh, takeaways uh, before I give things over to Steve. Uh, some of the key insights from our research to help cut through the noise and really distinguish the important takeaways. In the U.S., uh, we've seen the U.S. dollar bounce back. Uh, the U.S. dollar had fallen to 15-month lows in July against a basket of currencies. And for the dollar index, uh, the trade-weighted dollar index, it had fallen below 100, the key 100 level, uh, for the first time since uh, April of last year. U.S. inflation, though, it did take a wrong turn in the latest period. We did see inflation move higher, and that was a sign that maybe the Fed is not done hiking interest rates. And in Europe, we've seen both uh, the euro and the U.K. pounds. Uh, they have slid to uh, mid-June lows, and that's on worries about global growth. And those concerns uh, have sparked some safe haven buying of the U.S. dollar. Uh, the dollar has also been boosted by signs of a resilient U.S. economy, and that has sent Treasury yields uh, soaring to 16-year uh, highs uh, with the yield on the 10-year uh, above 4.3%. And that's pretty much uh, where we stand today. We're still around that 4.3% level uh, for Treasury yields. And that explains why we have seen the dollar really pad its gains uh, since the month of August. Down under, well, the Aussie dollar did plunge to nine-month lows uh, below 64 cents. Worries about uh, China's economy. Uh, that threatens to curb Asian demand for some of uh, Australia's prized uh, resource exports. And that, of course, uh, poses a headwind uh, to global growth, uh, the weakness that we have seen uh, with the Chinese economy. So just over a short space of time, we've really witnessed some meaningful shifts in the FX landscape. And uh, that highlights the importance for companies with exposure to FX markets uh, to be mindful of when making planning decisions. What I want to cover here is uh, a market events calendar. Uh, we know that the road ahead for a global monetary policy is going to depend on data and the strength of that data. So with that in mind, uh, one of the things we want to do is cover the events calendar for September, highlighting some of the big data to come and some of the events you may want to circle on your calendar. Some of the key events to look for, inflation. Uh, that's the one thing that seems to be uh, certainly top of mind for central bankers. Inflation reports, uh, they'll start, start to trickle in around the middle of the month in mid-September. We're going to get uh, the U.S. Consumer Price Index. So around the mid to late September, that's when you're going to start to see inflation surveys uh, pour in from around the world. Jobs data, uh, jobs data is also key. We've already had the U.S. jobs reports. Uh, that's usually out on the first Friday of the month. And uh, once again, we did see a solid pace of hiring. And I think that has uh, also helped the dollar uh, at that has helped lend traction to the rebound we have seen in the U.S. dollar. And uh, September interest rate decisions, they tend to carry more weight and market influence because central banks like the Fed, like the ECB, they publish fresh economic forecasts uh, in September. They do so on a quarterly basis. So the Fed, uh, the Fed is also going to publish where they see interest rates headed over the coming year. So really important stuff. And we just wanted to um, uh, highlight that. So now I'm going to toss it over to Steve. Steve's going to unpack the most important macro themes to be aware of and cover topics like interest rates, inflation, and uh, the tightening of credit conditions and how that could influence currencies. 
Take it away, Steve. Thank you, Joe. Um, look, I think when we think about the start of this year, markets have been very negative on the future global growth uh, expectations. Interest rates around the world had gone up so much. Um, markets were still dealing with the post-pandemic uh, impact. The view was that global growth would probably be very slow this year, and it was. But what wasn't slow was the performance of markets. Markets have stayed really strong. Parts of the economy have remained really resilient. And in particular, inflation has remained higher. And this has played out most notably with this first theme we're looking at at the moment, with interest rates still very much higher and a view that markets believe that interest rates will remain higher for longer. We saw that overnight. There was a stronger than expected US services PMI number. The market was expecting around 52 and a half. It came in at 54 and a half. And bond yields pushed higher back towards 4.3% on the 10 year. And chances for a rate hike from the Federal Reserve are now 50 50 when we look at that November meeting. So inflation staying higher, growth remaining better than expected, and the fact that uh, bond yields remain higher really is a sign that um, for now, uh, it's one big risk that markets need to face, that if interest rates do stay longer, what does that mean for market valuations? What does that mean for the ability of consumers to withstand higher debt? And what does that mean for businesses that will find funding more difficult? So clearly, this is one of the big themes, despite the fact that the global economy and global markets have performed a lot better than expected. This remains a big threat, a big theme as we look into Q4 of 2023. On the next slide, you'll see that when we talk about uh, the global economy performing well, um, it's only in pockets. And one pocket that is clearly underperforming here is global trade. That's part of the reason why the Australian dollar is under such pressure at the moment, because part of the economy, the services part of the economy is doing really well. But the manufacturing part of the economy continues to really underwhelm. That's why Germany is struggling so much this year. That's why China is struggling so much this year. And if you look at this chart, you can see the global growth and trade really trending lower. And in fact, the levels we're at is comparable, uh, well, not comparable, but we haven't seen it as worse since the GFC or during the pandemic. So while markets remain relatively elevated, and we've said it before, but the US's S&P 500 is up 20% so far this year, the NASDAQ gained as much as 50% this year before reversing back lower, but global growth is slowing and particularly trade in manufactured goods is really slowing as well. That's what's really driving currencies like the Australian dollar and the Canadian dollar weaker. And it remains a big threat despite the fact that markets remain higher. The third theme I want to cover really ties in with what we are talking about in terms of higher bond yields and higher interest rates is that credit conditions have tightened incredibly over the last six months. And of course, higher interest rates have played into it, but also the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank back in March has also played into it. Now in green here, you can see the yearly change in credit conditions, and that's skyrocketed to levels that, again, we haven't seen since the GFC. The dark blue line is the change in US unemployment. And you can see that when credit conditions tighten, unemployment often rises as well. So again, as I mentioned, growth's held up well, markets remain high, but Another final key theme we're looking at is credit condition tightening takes time to impact on the economy, and that's really what we're watching for at the moment. How will that play out? And again, that shows you why, despite the fact that growth and markets remain more resilient, that remains another big threat going into Q4 and into 2024. Now, let's look at probably the biggest theme this month that I already mentioned that uh, when it comes to the Federal Reserve, it's seen as a 50-50 chance whether they'll hike rates in November. So the September Federal Reserve decision probably isn't the big event this month. What is 
is the ECB. And the European Central Bank is really seen as one of the last chances that they can hike rates. The expectation that the ECB would raise rates at a quicker pace than the uh, Federal Reserve is what drove the euro so much higher so far this year. But the euro has turned quite significantly, mainly by versus the US dollar, but versus other markets as well. But the euro has been supported by expectations that the ECB will raise rates. It's recently come off. And over the next two weeks, as we go into that ECB meeting, if the European Central Bank doesn't raise rates, then that can what drive a big turn in the euro, which, as I said, has been strong all year, but might be meeting a turning point. That ECB decision will be critical. And then finally, one major theme to look at when we're thinking about the broad market is that I mentioned that markets have remained strong, but growth is weakening The next couple of months is where we need to see growth pick up. If growth doesn't pick up, then that's where all of a sudden the fact that equity markets are higher, but growth remains sluggish, the rubber's going to hit the road on one of two sides. Growth is either going to come back, and if growth doesn't come back, then that sets up markets for a reappraisal of future outcomes. And that's really, I think, where one of the risks will be as we go into that fourth quarter with equity markets so much higher and growth underperforming, we run the risk of markets reevaluating and coming back. And that's why certainly that uh, we can see further big moves and further volatility in global markets and FX markets as we look over the next few months. Joe, I'll pass back to you. All right. Thank you, Steve, for that uh, wonderful update on the global landscape. So uh, for North America, uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, going to be some uh, volatility analysis. Um, So here we go. Here I want to, uh, the the volatility analysis, uh, that's a good measure of peak to trough volatility that we see for a given time period. And uh, there are a couple of currency pairs that I'd like to highlight. Uh, For example, uh, the Mexican peso and the Canadian dollar, uh, dollar Mexico. If you see it there on the second line, we can see that uh, for year to date, the trading range has really been volatile. Uh, we're talking a trading range of more than 17% when you measure the year to date high at 19.5 roughly, uh, down to 16.6 uh, roughly. So again, that is quite a wide range. Uh, we have seen the dollar move off those lows, the 16.6 low, it's back in the 17 area, 17 per US dollar but still uh, quite a a wide range there. And uh, it really has to do with uh, interest rate differentials. In the US, uh, we know that interest rates are at 22 year highs, roughly uh, 5.4%. But if you go to Mexico, if you're in Mexico uh, or investing in uh, peso denominated assets, uh, Mexican interest rates are twice as high as the US. They're at 11.25% still. Uh, that is a record high. So that explains a lot of the outperformance uh, we continue to see for the peso uh, versus its U.S. counterpart. I also want to uh, touch on Dollar Canada. Uh, that's another uh, popular currency pair uh, over here. Dollar Canada is now flat to positive uh, for the year. And that's, uh, we saw a little reaction today, or, or Wednesday that is, uh, from the Bank of Canada's rate decision, uh, which uh, at which Ottawa, they did keep interest rates uh, steady at 5%. So that was pretty much the expectation. And uh, the market thought that maybe we'd see a little bit of a, a more concern from uh, Ottawa on the growth outlook, given that uh, we saw that the, the Canadian economy contracted in Q2. It did so mildly, but uh, that was certainly uh, different compared to what the, the Bank of Canada itself had forecast. Uh, the Bank of Canada thought the economy for the uh, for for Q2, it advanced by 1.5%. What happened was it was down uh, two tenths of a percent. So a big wrong turn there, but that's something the central bank generally wants to see. It wants to see the economy slow so that it brings down high inflation. Uh, and uh, the one thing that really made uh, today's decision more of a hawkish hold, if you will, from uh, the Bank of Canada was that uh, Canada left the door open to raising rates if they're not happy with uh, how they see inflation unfolding over the coming months. 
Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we have seen the U.S. dollar continue to outperform against Canada, at least over recent weeks. And that's as those uh, global concerns about, well, those worries about global growth, uh, they continue to take a toll on some of the commodity linked currencies that are closely linked to uh, the global business cycle. And uh, for Dollar Canada, the year to date range has been nearly 6% when you consider the uh, the peak at 138 uh, so far this year. And uh, the trough uh, that came just inside of 131. Now, in terms of uh, currency market volatility, or uh, in terms of the value indicator, uh, this is how we size up a currency's performance against its long-term averages uh, to kind of gauge favorable or unfavorable market swings. Uh, in this situation, I want to talk about uh, the top line there, dollar yen. Uh, uh, the Japanese yen uh, continues to flounder, and it's been doing so pretty significantly to the point that the market is on edge uh, with the levels where we are right now for uh, potential intervention uh, from Japan uh, to try and uh, put a floor under their currency. So uh, as we approach uh, the 147s, the 150s, uh, that's the terrain where uh, Japanese authorities intervened a year ago in September of 2022. And uh, it's not really a, a frequent thing. Uh, the Japanese authorities before the intervention from last year it had been nearly a quarter century since the last time we saw uh, Japan step into the market. So the mar market's kind of walking on eggshells now to see if uh, Tokyo steps in. But one of the things that's really weighed on the yen is uh, Japan's cautious approach to monetary policy. Uh, interest rates in Japan, they remain below zero. They've been there since 2016. By contrast, we've seen the, the Fed raise interest rates by some 525 basis points since last year. So those interest rate differentials, uh, they have really uh, weighed on the Japanese currency and given the dollar a solid uh, yield advantage against its Japanese counterpart. So here, uh, if you take dollar yen, over the past 12 months, uh, the average rate for dollar yen has been about 138. And that's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a level 5% below where the market is today. If you take it over a two-year horizon, uh, the pair has averaged about 130 per dollar, and that's nearly 12% uh, below today's market. And if you go back, say, five years, well, the average rate over that time period has been 117 for dollar yen, or uh, that's a, a whopping difference of some 24% from where we are today. So this is a very useful uh, measurement tool uh, for gauging volatility, comparing various time periods uh, for both perspective and to assess opportunity. I also want to touch on uh, sterling, uh, GBP USD. We can see that uh, the pound remains a high-flying currency for this year. Uh, the pound's at 126. Well, that's when we compiled the research. We've since seen the, uh, the British pound fall a little bit further, but at 126, the pound was nearly 2% above its year-to-date average, uh, that year-to-date average being 124. And uh, sterling is about 4% stronger uh, compared to its average rate of 121 over the last year. So again, uh, this just goes to show um, how to take high-level views into consideration uh, when you're making your currency plans. Now, next, I want to talk about uh, some future scenarios. In this case, I want to talk about uh, the euro-US dollar uh, exchange rate. And on this chart, if you look to the left, that's the actual uh, historical activity we've seen. Uh, certainly, we've seen uh, the euro has all but erased its gains for the year against the dollar. And that's quite an about face from what we saw as recently as July when the euro had marched to uh, 112.75. Uh, that was a 17 month peak for the euro against the greenback. But since then, we've seen the euro shed some five cents or 5% in uh, the span of less than two months. So ECB rate hikes to tackle high inflation, uh, that is starting to bite the economy over there. The ECB has jacked up interest rates to 3.75%. That's the highest level in 22 years. But we can see that it's taken a toll on the economy because uh, if you consider uh, Germany, uh, the bloc's largest economy in Europe, it contracted in Q4 of last year. It did so again in Q1 of this year. And for Q2 of uh, this year, uh, it didn't grow, but it also didn't contract. It just flatlined. So we're yet to see the German economy uh, show signs of turning the corner 
And uh, like Steve highlighted in the global section, uh, I think uh, ECB officials, uh, they may be running low, but their window may be closing in terms of uh, how much opportunity they may have to raise rates to tackle inflation if the economy over there continues to lose steam. So our central forecast uh, for the euro calls for the euro to maybe move towards 109 by the end of the year. Now that's if the ECB continues to raise rates while the Fed moves to the sidelines. Uh, so uh, that's how that could be something that could provide some uh, support for the euro. Now the upside argument for the euro, could we see the euro uh, move towards 110 perhaps? Well, under that situation, we would need to see the global outlook improve or uh, we would need to see the U.S. economy uh, show signs of losing its resilience. And if that were to happen, maybe the conversation turns to the Fed cutting interest rates. Uh, certainly not this year, the market's thinking, but uh, uh, sometime over the course of next year. Uh, so that could be a factor that could move the euro higher. Then again, uh, the other side of the coin is um, what could drive the euro further lower, maybe the 105 to 106 range. Well, we'll have to see what uh, winter uh, brings. Uh, we're not far from autumn. Uh, and once uh, the winter comes, what kind of temperature, what kind of weather uh, does uh, Europe experience? Uh, if we have colder temperatures, uh, that could trigger concerns about energy supplies and, and heating. And uh, that could be something that could limit scope for the ECB to raise rates and maybe uh, pull forward the time frame for uh, some ECB monetary easing. Now, on the next slide here for me, I want to talk about Dollar Canada, the future scenarios. Uh, this pair really il illustrates uh, the turn higher we have seen in the greenback. So around 136 now for Dollar Canada. Uh, Dollar Canada has uh, turned positive uh, for the year. Not by much, but uh, that's still quite a feat from where it was uh, just a, a, several weeks ago or a, a couple months ago when we saw dollar yen, excuse me, dollar Canada fall as low as 130.90. Uh, that was a 2023 20, low. You have to go back 10 months the last time we've seen that. And here we've seen uh, dollar Canada rip higher to 136. But uh, the dollar, the US dollar, that is not quite out of the woods uh, because our central forecast uh, sees uh, dollar Canada maybe drifting towards 132 by December. Uh, like I said, uh, today's uh, Bank of Canada rate decision, they didn't close the door to higher interest rates. Uh, they kept rates at 5%. And uh, if they need to come off the sidelines again, uh, maybe that could provide some support to the Canadian dollar if we don't see uh, inflation continue to come down. Uh, the upside scenario for the Canadian dollar or for the US dollar versus Canada, what if Canada's economy continues to slow down but uh, too much. What if the slowdown uh, starts to accelerate? I think that could be a situation that could lead to a material jump in unemployment and uh, potentially prompt uh, the Bank of Canada to pull forward the, the time frame for interest rate cuts. Now, a downside scenario for Dollar Canada, could we move towards 130 once again? Well, we'd have to see the Canadian economy. One of the things that would need to happen is we need to see the Canadian economy start to flash uh, renewed signs of resilience. Uh, if, if inflation veers the wrong way in Canada, if it starts to accelerate, again, we heard from uh, the Bank of Canada directly on Wednesday that they stand ready to raise interest rates again if needed. And uh, to be sure, inflation uh, in Canada did jump in the latest period. It jumped uh, back above 3% from 2.8% uh, in June. In the meantime, if you look at oil prices, uh, they've marched higher. Uh, oil prices at $88 a barrel, a, a barrel, that's a 10 month high and that's inflationary. So we'll have to keep our eyes on oil. Uh, that's gonna help shape sentiment for inflation, not only in Canada, but certainly among the major economies. So now I wanna pivot back to Steve and he's gonna cover the outlook for the APEC region. Thank you very much, Joe. Great insights, thank you. Look, um, in terms of the um, Australian dollar and uh, currencies around the um, region, you can really see if we look at where the most volatility has been over the last uh, month or so, it's really come back with a vengeance in the Kiwi US and the Aussie US. And like we said right at the start, that move in US bond yields higher has really been one of the biggest impacts in FX markets. FX markets are closely tied to interest rates, to bond yields, 
but they are particularly tied in Australia and in New Zealand because historically markets have uh, used the uh, Australian dollar and the New Zealand dollar to speculate on the difference between Aussie, New Zealand and US interest rates. So that big move higher in US bond yields has particularly hit the uh, Kiwi US and the Aussie US. And normally as volatility goes up, the Aussie and the Kiwi go down. So you can really see as we hit those lows, volatility uh, is really part of what's driving that. Um, the other part where we've seen a pickup in volatility has been in those European markets. And Joe just talked about how we've seen quite a bit of movement both in the euro and in the uh, British pound over the last couple of months. That's really driven a pickup of volatility in the Aussie pound, the Kiwi euro and the Aussie euro. On the other hand, we're probably most interesting to note where volatility has just collapsed has been in the Australian dollar versus New Zealand dollar pair, or if you want to flip it around, the New Zealand dollar versus Australian dollar pair. Um, right, a big collapse in um, uh, uh, in volatility. Markets really see both the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand as being on hold. And with very little change in expectations between those two currencies, we've seen them both uh, slip into a very low volatility state. If we look at where the um, value is and where the market's moving against the uh, Aussie dollar at the moment, uh, similar to what we've seen recently, the Aussie yen really seen a strong move higher versus its historical averages, up 3% on the year-to-date average, up 15% on the five-year average, the Aussie right near highs. And uh, historically, the Aussie yen has tended to find a ceiling between 95 and 97. And we're seeing that on an ongoing basis at the moment. Every time we move up to that level, the Aussie, key, Aussie yen tends to fall back lower. Um, Aussie Kiwi also uh, up at uh, recent highs as well. But again, like we said, uh, with it having moved in a relatively tight band, it's not quite as exciting as perhaps it looks up at the top of a relatively small band. To the downside, again, um, something that we've covered, both myself and Joe already, um, where the Aussie's been particularly pressured has been that strength in the euro and the strength in the British pound, uh, down around about 4% on a year-to-date average versus the euro, down about a 6% year-to-date average versus the pound and uh, over the long term uh, down around between six and seven percent for each of those pairs is there a chance of a rebound well as we mentioned when we look at the potential for both the bank of england and the ecb to near the end of their rate hiking process then we might to see some weakness in the euro and some weakness in the pound but of course the other big story in the aussie dollar is that the Aussie's been pressured, not just by what's going on in other currencies, but very much with that Chinese growth story. And if we flick onto the next slide, you'll really see when we look at our forecasts out over the next 12 to 18 months, we certainly don't see any strong recovery in the Australian dollar because of two big factors. First of all, this slowdown in global manufacturing, as I mentioned at the start, it's hit Germany and it's hit China, most notably, but it's also very much weighing on the Australian dollar. Um, if you look at the Australian economy, we actually had some pretty good GDP numbers out yesterday. The June quarter GDP up 2.1% in annual terms. That's a pretty good rate. As we mentioned, global growth is slowing. So from that perspective, the Aussie economy is doing well. It's a real sentiment story that's hidden the Aussie dollar. Worries about China hitting the Australian dollar and keeping us near lows. The other factor, of course, is Australian interest rates. They feel high if you're in Australia. They feel high if you're in Australia with a mortgage. But compared to the rest of the world, Australian interest rates at 4.1. Um, in Canada, they're 5%. In the UK, they're 5.25%. In New Zealand, they're at 5.5%. Um, even in Europe, they're above Australian rates at 4.25. So that's what's really weighing on the Aussie dollar as well. And unless we see a pickup in growth in China, unless we see a shift in interest rate differentials, um, the Aussie dollar likely to remain stuck in this sort of 
mid to high 60 zone. So at the end of the year, we do see a move up towards 67. But for now, no substantive rally in the Aussie dollar. If we look at the Kiwi, the New Zealand dollar, US dollar pair, it's a similar story. Worries about, you know, particularly global growth, worries about China um, impacting. Uh, the New Zealand dollar has also been impacted, even though interest rates are relatively high um, in New Zealand at 5.5%. That big move higher in US bond yields is really driving this market a little bit more than the official rates from the respective central banks. So, you know, with a view that maybe we've got more hikes to come in the US, we probably don't. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, that's what's driving the um, Kiwi US lower as well. The interesting thing about the um, US is in the short term, there are rate hikes priced in. Over the longer term, there's actually rate cuts priced in. Okay, into our regional Asian markets and the dollar CNY has been really in focus, of course. It's been moving back uh, to uh, the highest level since the GFC, up around that 720, 730 level. Um, in the short term, there's a view that we can push higher if we continue to hear bad news out of China. But this 720, 730 level historically has been where the People's Bank of China has pushed back. So it seems like that's a short term level for Chinese yuan buyers to really be focused on. And we see over the medium term a move back lower, back towards that 715 by the end of the year. And it's a similar story in the dollar seeing that's moved up to the highest level of the year, up above 135, 136. Um, we don't see a substantial move lower, but certainly a drift lower towards 134 by the end of the year. Well, that's certainly um, a lot going on in um, the uh, APAC uh, market, but um, away from what we're seeing, these big moves uh, in FX markets, I'll hand over to Joe and we can cover how some of these big moves and some of these very fast moves are impacting on businesses throughout the region. Joe. Thank you, Steve. Great update there. So this is where we want to bring Rob into the conversation. Uh, we're going to pose some uh, questions, some important questions to Rob for his take and for some insight uh, when it comes to uh, managing risk and, and these volatile and some of these currencies, uh, given the volatility that we have seen. So uh, Rob, um, FX markets have seen some big moves this year. Uh, if you consider uh, Aussie US, uh, that has fallen to within a couple cents uh, away from its pandemic lows. Uh, the pound has uh, certainly bounced back this year from all-time lows last year. What do these types of moves, uh, what type, the, what types of these big moves, what do they mean for businesses? Thank you, Joe. Um, well, as we've seen, you know, in your presentation already with the um, the global outlook and the summary, um, we've seen some really big moves recently. And depending on um, the direction that you're buying or selling current foreign currency. Um, you know, this may present an opportunity, but for many of our customers, it's actually bringing a lot of pain. Um, FX um, is the lifeblood of many of the businesses that we help, um, and, a, and a big move in the market can, um, can really have a big impact. Typically, that impact um, will be on a budget rate or a target rate, um, rates that customers and businesses have used in order to try and plan for their future. So where we have a big move, um, it can upset your planning and your forecasting. It may need, it may uh, lead you to need to change prices. Um, it may lead you to be uncompetitive where you don't have an ability to change prices. Um, and it may even impact your customer relationships. So these big moves are always um, difficult for customers and, and can present um, a, uh, an uncomfortable scenario. So when we're speaking to our customers and uh, we are listening to the voice of our customers, you know, what are we hearing? Most of our customers that are um, impacted by these moves are, are basically saying, look, we've missed the boat. What can we do? Um, my answer to that is usually um, coming, comes back to planning, right? Have a plan. It's never too late to have a plan. Even if the plan you may have had in place three or six months ago would have helped you now, um, you know, your business still needs to look into the future. Um, and so when having a plan um, and thinking about how you may introduce hedging to help your business, there are two key areas that I think it's important to consider. 
The first is what I like to call the approach. So always be thinking about not only, you know, which product are you going to hedge, but how much are you going to hedge? How far into the future are you going to hedge? How often are you going to hedge? How does that hedging um, match your business needs, your pricing cycles, your goals, et cetera? Um, the other aspect, which uh, tends to be more, more uh, popular for, for discussing is the product, right? Which product are you going to use? Um, and product can be an interesting one when we've seen big moves because some uh, of our customers will never have hedged before. Um, and, you know, they may be forced to um, deal currency at these uh, extreme rates. Um, other customers may have hedged, but with basic uh, products and um, never, you know, explored something more um, extensive. So, I would definitely say that um, conversations with customers now um, are definitely talking about products in terms of, you know, how different products can work and how they may fit um, a business needs. Um, we um, are seeing customers looking at products that they potentially haven't used before or, or a progression from um, like a, a simple forward to maybe an option. Um, and one of the, um, one of the um, suggestions I like to make is, you know, if you're a customer with a budget rate and you've missed your, missed your opportunity to achieve that, um, the markets can keep moving. Now, if they keep moving against you, it doesn't hurt to have some hedging in place. And if that hedging will, will also be a product that allows you to achieve your budget rate if the market does uh, reverse or, or re, um, move back in a more favorable direction, um, then that can be a good approach. Um, we're also seeing some customers using um, a less sort of defensive strategy and, you know, Convera has a, a huge um, spectrum of products, um, some of which, like I said, um, customers haven't seen before. So um, exposing customers to those different solutions can definitely, um, can definitely be something to consider um, and something that uh, your dealer or your, your uh, corporate hedging manager can, can definitely help you with. Yeah, that's terrific. Never too late to have a plan. Uh, good stuff there. And uh, the FX moves, uh, they haven't just been large. They've also been very quickly, if you consider uh, Aussie US, that's down about 7.5% since mid-July over the past two months. Over the same period of time, uh, Euro US, uh, that has fallen uh, by 5%. So uh, again, it's not just uh, the scope, but uh, over the short period of time, um, how these how are these sharp moves? impacting the customers that you speak with? Um, yeah, I mean, along the same vein, these these sharp moves also present a challenge because um, when they happen quickly, it can, um, you know, it, it can cause distress, especially where we have customers that have got a slow decision-making process. So sometimes we speak to customers that have got um, internal approval processes or need to get board approval, et cetera. Um, and so where there's kind of a lack of framework, I suppose, in terms of decision making, it can really slow things down. And so if you if you do need to act quickly, but your, um, you know, your approach to hedging or approach to foreign exchange prevents you from doing that, um, it can be really painful. So having a hedging framework in place definitely helps customers in these types of situations. Um, quick moves are... Um, different to slower moves in, in certain ways. Slower moves obviously allow you to um, plan a bit more and, and take time to think about how you're going to match your hedging with your, your forecasting as your, as your business needs change and as the market moves, whereas fast moves can sort of um, prevent you having that luxury. They can also lead to irrational decisions. Um, I think back to early COVID when we saw um, some very, very uh, large fast moves um, and we saw a lot of sort of irrational hedging customers. Um, some customers ended up hedging at rates which were um, definitely um, not favorable. And, you know, had they had time to consider a better plan, maybe a different product, they perhaps could have, um, they, they perhaps could have had a better outcome when the market did essentially recover. So um, if you are in that situation, what can you do right now? Well, First and foremost, I would I would recommend um, speak to your representative at um, at Convera. Um, we have a, a team of experts here that are definitely very very keen to help you. Um, in the short term, maybe consider products that um, can help you to to get you through this um, through this tough period, um, and hopefully give you time to adapt to um, your future state. All right, that's terrific. Thank you. Now uh, another one. Uh, that we have, let's see. 
FX moves have been large, but also uh, very fast in terms of um, some of the, the movement and the impact on risk management decisions. Uh, do they differ in other ways? Um, I think that sort of covers the question that I just answered, but essentially, um, you know, fast moves need fast action. And so um, always, you know, keep a, an open relationship with your uh, representative at um, Kavira. We don't want to just be there when it's time to deal. We want to be there with you the whole way through. Um, and we, we are able to keep you up to date um, so that we hopefully don't uh, find ourselves in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, U.S. bond yields, uh, they're back at post-global financial crisis highs. The data says credit conditions are tightening. What are you seeing? Are businesses starting to feel the pain of tighter credit conditions? We are seeing um, a few um, a few reactions to the rise in interest rates that we've seen. Um, typically, I could sort of boil that down to sort of three different categories. The first would be the actual uncertainty we're seeing in the FX rates, as we know, ultimately interest rates drive foreign exchange or foreign exchange rates. So when you um, not only have um, uh, big changes in interest rates, but also um, globally, each country changing their rates at different paces and, and the market generally, generally trying to predict what the next uh, move is going to be, uh, it definitely introduces um, additional uncertainty and, and causes um you know, it causes volatility within the FX market. The second, um, the second area that I think gets impacted by these uh, interest rate rises we see is is um, on the funding side. So, you know, managing cash flow for our customers is is more important than ever. Um, from a hedging perspective, hedging is not only a tool that allows you to protect a rate, but it, um, you know, it's also an excellent tool in terms of managing cash flow because essentially you're delaying the need to make a payment until the, the time that you actually need the currency. So that um, that is uh, one of the um, one of the results of the impact on funding. And then lastly, um, client behaviour. So um, our customers are not only dealing with us, but you know they're dealing with their customers and so on. Um, and so. Sometimes customer behavior can change um, without any kind of uh, warning. So one of the benefits to hedging or certain hedging products, I suppose, or approaches is that it introduces flexibility into the portfolio and can um, not only protect the rate, but help you to manage cash flows or manage uncertain cash flows, which is um, something or, or a benefit, let's say, that is, is sometimes overlooked um, you know, in terms of uh, hedging products. So I mentioned earlier the, the two areas being approach and product. If you um, can combine those um, two areas effectively, you can end up with a, um, you know, a hedging um, portfolio or a hedging strategy that can, that can really help you through the good and the bad. So, um, you know, lots happening in terms of um, how our customers are reacting to the current situation. But if I was going to summarize, um, you know, what um, is best for customers, I would say don't look back. Um, always be looking forward. Think about the, the future um, needs of your business and where we are today. Um, build a plan around that. Speak to your Convera uh, rep in order to help you manage your needs. Excellent insight, Rob. Thank you very much. We appreciate your perspective. Thank you. And so now let's go ahead and move on to the Q&A session. We can just do it on this page here. Uh, one question has come in. I have. Uh, I'll, I can take this one. How, let's see here. How many rate cuts do you see on the Fed's table uh, for 2024? Uh, that's a good question. Um, markets at this point, uh, I saw some information today, some forecasts that suggested the Fed could cut rates uh, nearly by nearly 100 basis points uh, next year. If we continue to see inflation cool, if we continue to see the U.S. economy lose momentum, uh, that's one thing that the markets are, are pricing in because Inflation in the U.S., it's above 3%, but if we continue to see progress down towards uh, the Fed's 2% goal, if inflation is coming down in a meaningful way and yet interest rates remain really high, the Fed's going to need to uh, take some action. Otherwise, they run the risk of uh, maintaining uh, policy that's too restrictive and that maybe pumps the economic brakes uh, too much. So uh, that's one of the reasons uh, the markets think that uh, it's certainly uh, 
early to guess on that. But uh, the, the great thing about this, uh, next week, we're going to hear from, uh, excuse, not, not next week, the week after next, on the 20th of September, uh, that's when we're going to have the next Fed decision. And they'll come out. They'll uh, give us uh, their best guess. It's not an ironclad pledge by any imagination, but they'll give us uh, their best estimate at where they see U.S. interest rates, uh, not only the end of this year, but uh, the end of next year as well. So uh, that could go some way in helping to shape uh, FX market sentiment. Let's see if we have any more. I do have another one uh, for Steve. What do you need to see for a strong Chinese recovery? And will this help uh, the Aussie move higher? Yeah, well, I mean, as far as in Australia, right throughout the region, that's what we're all looking for. And um, everything we've seen from Chinese authorities so far has just been piecemeal. It's been incremental. It's been little by little. Um, and we haven't seen that, what we used to call that big bazooka um, stimulus that we got from China back in 2009 after the GFC, or even in 2016, we saw a big Chinese slowdown in, in 2015 that was followed by large stimulus. Um, again, um, that's a very much a, a policy decision from Chinese authorities because they don't want to reinflate the uh, property market. Um, that's clearly a, a sign that um, they don't want to go down that path again. So we need to see really large scale stimulus, but stimulus away from residential housing. Um, and they're just wrestling with that at the moment, trying to work out what they've got uh, that can drive growth like residential housing has. And whether you're in Australia or um, New Zealand or the UK, uh, the US, uh, housing's a major dominant part of the economy. So trying to work out how to drive an economy while not reinflating the housing market is a headache. And that's the headache that China has at the moment. I guess what's interesting is that if you look at some of the key exports from Australia, iron ore is still $110 a tonne, well above the long run average. Crude oil, for example, close to $90 a barrel, uh, long above the well above the long run average. Um, you know, commodities are holding up relatively well, and there still is lots of growth in China. Um, there still is a lot of uh, growth uh, in China. Um, it just isn't uh, that residential construction growth that we've seen. And without that, with that big hole, um, that's what's keeping um, Chinese growth underwhelming. So um, it's a difficult question. There's no easy answer. And that's what's driving this slowdown globally. Without residential housing, what we probably need to see is a re-establishment of um, manufactured goods. And you know, we've said it before, but you know, during the pandemic, everyone bought new monitors for their work from home studios they bought new exercise bikes they bought new exercise clothing they bought nintendos uh for the kids and they bought new tv screens um once we see that cycle restart because a lot of those products you only buy once every five years once we see a pickup in global manufacturing demand again then that's when we'll see chinese growth picking up as well that demand for manufactured goods again that seems a little while away so hoping for any great recovery from china Looks like it might still be some time away for now. All right. And I do see one here in the chat. Uh, any outlook on the Indian rupee? Yeah, look, the rupee's been you know, broadly weaker in line with you know that slowdown in global growth. It's uh closely tied to um closely tied to to, to global growth. So um as a result, that's um mainly been weaker um as well. Uh so as a result, um, you know. We uh, some of the conditions that will help the RMB, the Chinese yuan, will help the um, INR um, as well. So for now, uh, difficult to see any real catalyst for reversal, likely to remain under pressure while global growth remains under pressure. All right. And uh, that about does it. I do want to thank everybody uh, for joining today's webinar and the email address that you provided. Uh, we'll get back to you within 24 hours. Uh, we'll have a recording of this. And we're going to be happy to share that with you. And uh, this is a monthly webinar series. If you could please join us uh, early in October, when we'll have our next uh, webinar 
our next uh, global currency outlook. And we hope you can join us then. And uh, we'll have a survey. There should be a survey going through. If you have any suggestions, any topics you'd like us to cover, uh, we would be happy to go over that as well. And I want to thank, um, thank the guys for joining us and thank you for joining us as well. And we hope you have a good day and good luck. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.